Welcome to Nepal. Thank you so Please much. Climb the Mount Everest, right? That's where I'm going. Yeah. Kathmandu. It is here that I will begin to explore the captivating country of Nepal. In Nepal, Pasipati Nath is biggest temple. Yes, yeah, she will. That ended in 2006, right? Yeah, yeah, she will be here. And the next bank you can see the body cremation is happening there. I've never been to this country before. I've never been to the Kumbu Valley. I've never been to Mount Everest. It's not about this mountain. It's about you guys. Becoming a mountain guide, it's not easy. I want to say all girls, you should come and you can you can follow your dream. To come to it looks okay. And after that, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> what piece of advice would you give someone? If you want to climb the mountain and go back to your home, uh, just uh, prepare for it before you come here. Be scared and be intimidated and be humble. There's a lot of crevasse, open crevasse. I came to Nepal on a quest to explore this captivating country but I leave with so much more. What's up, everybody? This is Fred Rachani. We have right here via Zoom, the man you just saw in the trailer, The Quest Nepal. This man survived Mount Everest, has lived to tell about it, to document about it. We are talking to filmmaker Alex Harz. Alex, thank you so much for the time. How's everything going? Man, it's pretty good out here. You know, the weather's shifting a little bit here in Denver, Colorado, where I'm at, but all in all, I can't complain. And thanks so much for having me, Fred. Hey. I appreciate you taking the time. It is absolutely insane. There's so much I want to ask you about, but you mentioned that you're in Denver right now. So is that where you're based? And as mountain climbing, to put a lightly bit in your family? Uh, you know, that's where I'm based, but it's not traditionally in my family. I, you know, I was, I was born in Spain. I grew up in Europe. And then I spent my, uh, you know, high school years in the flatlands of Omaha, Nebraska. So it couldn't be farther away from mountains <laughs> when it came to that. But ultimately, this is where I ended up at. And this is where the Quest production is now based out of. And it, it, it's wild, right? It's hard enough to climb Mount Everest, to live, to tell about it. It's a whole nother animal to also document it. For those that don't know, I mean, I've worked on some documentaries. Like documentary filmmaking is not easy at all. Right. Combining the two. And I, I can't even imagine. So how the hell did you juggle everything between climbing Mount Everest, trying to stay alive, and also documenting this for our viewing pleasure? Well, you know what? Needless to say, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I was also a college athlete, and that didn't even remotely compare to climbing Everest and then to take it a little bit further by actually trying to document it all, you know, and come back down with 63 hours of content. You know, there's a lot of stuff that you can't control. In traditional filmmaking, as you know, a lot of it's staged, the blocking, everything's set up for you, the lighting's perfect, you know, the audio is all perfect. But when you're talking about a place like Nepal, you know, it's very hectic, it's organized chaos, you know, so a lot of it is run and gun, improvise as you go and deal with what you're thrown into. And then you just ramp it up times 10 once you get to Everest because your batteries can freeze, your camera might not turn off, they might fog up, you know, you have to worry about avalanches and all kinds of other things while you're trying to film at the same time and uh, also climb, like you said, stay alive. So it, needless to say, it was about as challenging as you can imagine. <laughs> and what's also challenging that some people may not think about is the traveling aspect, actually getting there in the first place. And I was uh, eerily amused by the most dangerous airport in the world. Can you tell us about that? <laughs> yeah. So once you get to Kathmandu, you're kind of thrown into this mixer of going back 50 years. And like I said, this organized chaos and you're right away inundated into a foreign world. Um, but then when you actually get settled in and then you have to head up for the expedition towards Everest, you know, which takes 52 days, you fly into this little tiny airport, if you want to call it that, in the village of Lukla because there are no roads that lead to Everest. So the only way you get there is by either walking a tremendous amount of distance or you have to fly there and then start trekking for nine days to get to base camp. So when you fly into Lukla, the pilot has to bank around this mountain and come in really hard and drop the nose down like this to hit this little tiny strip of asphalt. And then when he hits it, he's got to hit the brakes and stop the plane and spin it at the end of this tarmac before he runs into the side of the mountain. And mind you, Fred, the tarmac is about the size of three basketball courts. 
<laughs> yeah, that's not a lot of room for error there. <laughs> no, no, no. Unfortunately, it's not. And unfortunately, also there's quite a few fatalities that have taken place there. Not too long ago, four people died when a plane ran into a helicopter there on the tarmac. So, yeah, it's an unfortunate thing. But you know, if you want to climb Everest, uh, especially from the Nepal side, it's kind of one of the first gut check gambles you've got to take. Definitely. And how important were some of the bonds that you formed that we saw throughout the film and everything, not just to help you obviously accomplish this goal, but just to really understand the culture and, you know, just have a friend for life. Absolutely. First and foremost, that's probably the greatest thing I take away from this is, is my new bonded friends, my Sherpa's brothers and sisters that I have now that are basically like family that I've never met for the rest of my life. I mean, we've not only gone through an experience that, you know, that is, you know, pretty unique to say the least, but more importantly, the, their spirituality and their openness and givingness and the way that they just take you in is almost undescribable or indescribable. And it's something that I will never forget. And it's a bond that I'll, that I'll never, ever, you know, let myself cherish any further than I can at this point. I mean, it's just amazing. And, and if there's one thing I really think viewers will appreciate besides the obvious uh, bravery and you documenting this is the fact that you really kind of highlighted the culture and it wasn't one of those shows or films where it just kind of glosses over and look at me. I mean, no, you really went into like the traditions and everything else and also talked about the very unique political situation. How important for you was it going into this before even filming that you said, okay, you know what? I really want to highlight the culture and, and humanize these people and not just make it about the mountain. Absolutely right. Because, you know, in the West, especially when you think of Nepal, you don't know much about Nepal. You know, of course, Mount Everest, you know, put Nepal on the map back in 1953 when the first time it was climbed. But then otherwise, it's random little things like Dr. Strange, you know, floating around Kathmandu. But you really don't know anything about Nepal. So the whole point of the quest to begin with is to use the adventure, you know, to tell you the rest of the story. So it's really kind of an educational thrill ride. And in this case, we take Everest to tell you the story about the culture and about the history and the people of Nepal. And that's really what the main goal was, was to, yeah, that we could entertain you by climbing this mountain. Hopefully you'll learn something along the way, but also to really unveil that rarely seen culture that you just don't get to see in the West when it comes to any kind of documentaries. Now, from what I understand, you're not just a filmmaker. You've also been a performer, an actor, a philanthropist. Uh, you've had a, a ton of job titles. How did it lead you to this journey where, from what I understand, the quest isn't just a standalone documentary, but you're looking to make this into a series? Yeah, exactly. It's it's uh, it's designed to be an ongoing series. And the quest to Paul, and then also we have a VR component to this as well. Um, it was designed to be the launch title. And the reason why we picked Nepal and Mount Everest was because if we wanted to prove this concept and prove this series, why don't we go to the hardest and most difficult place first? Because if we pull it off there and we're humbly honored and fortunate to have done so, then we're pretty confident that we can replicate this in any other location, which of course is very important from a production and distribution side of things. Because a lot of people say, yeah, I want to do this, do this and do this. Sure, we all do, but can you actually pull it off? And so we've said, okay, let's put our money where our mouth is and let's see if we can, uh, you know, pull this one off. And if so, then we have a, a valid case to continue to do this further. When did you decide to go full bore into acting and filmmaking? Usually some people will go into acting first, maybe they'll go into filmmaking. You chose to do both and do kind of a little bit of everything. So how did you get to that journey in, in the first place? And what made you decide, you know what, I want to kind of live the best of both worlds, despite the fact that, you know, it's not easy all the time. Yeah, you know, because it originally came from climbing a mountain. I was climbing some of the highest mountains around in order to prepare to go to Everest. So it was a long, long journey to get ready to go to Everest. And that was based off a childhood promise I made to myself when I was a young kid. After a soccer practice sitting in Nebraska, I saw something on Everest. And I said to myself, one day I'm going to climb that mountain. And for out of sight and out of mind for many, many years, then I'm sitting on my couch in Denver, Colorado, watching some random daytime television. And for no apparent reason, that recollection dawned on me again and said, Alex, you promised yourself you're going to climb Everest. The next day I started. No idea what I was doing. I had no idea how to go about it. I started climbing the 14ers, which are the highest mountains here in Colorado, 14,000 foot peaks in the wintertime and snowboarding gear, overweighted, sweaty, no clue what I was doing. But I was like, OK, I've got to start somewhere. And then that process of, it, of trying to honor a childhood commitment to myself began. But along that way, when I was climbing in Argentina, the highest mountain in South America, as well as then the highest mountain in, in North America, Denali in Alaska, 
I was standing on the summit of Denali and I was looking out over the Alaska range at 1130 at night because it has that perpetual sun, you know, in the middle of the summer. And I said to myself, wow, this is amazing and beautiful and all that, but I can't just do this for the few moments of standing up here to look at the most amazing scenery you can imagine because it's too much risk, too much time. It costs too much money. It alters your life too much. I said, I've got to do something bigger than just stand on top of this mountain. And that's how the quest was born. And I said, well, why don't I take my experience in acting and filmmaking, improv, you know, and so on and mold that all together. And hopefully I can take people then on these journeys to reveal what I'm seeing and experiencing, because I know that the majority of the world will not have that opportunity otherwise. Definitely. And you're not just, of course, the filmmaker, you are the host of the quest and everything. Are you still looking to do more acting and, and improv and, and performing arts as well? Or is this kind of your main focus at this point? You know, it, no, I, I like it. And I had a radio show before this, you know, a, a live improvised comedy radio show, which at the time was the only one in the world where we did live improv over the air based on suggestions of people coming in, driving down the highway, whatever, Facebook, Twitter, and so on posts. And we acted it out there with 25 improvisers right there in the studio. Um, and I love it. I have a lot of passion for that. But then I realized if I'm going to put all eggs into one basket because the amount of work and effort it takes to do these quests, especially climbing Mount Everest, for example, all the training, preparation, pre-production, all that. Um, I got to focus on one thing at a time. And in this case, I said, okay, let's make quest the quest that the primary focus. We'll see what the other things hold. And of course, I'm always open, you know, to other opportunities. But uh, right now, my main focus front and center is the, the quest series. It makes sense. And you're still a relatively young guy. So it might make sense for you to do this, be adventurous, you know, put your body through the ringer, you know, by choice. And then, you know, after a while, maybe you want to go back to improv. <laughs> That's exactly right. And if you want to join me on stage, Fred, we'll, we'll do that anytime you want. <laughs> hey, I, you know, what? I just took an improv class in London, so I'll hold you to it. That's very cool. That's very, very cool. <laughs> awesome. And I just want to get this right too. May 24th is when we expect the Quest Nepal to be available on all major streaming platforms, including iTunes, right? Correct. That's it. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Now, before we let you go, we always like to ask our guests some kind of random rapid fire questions just to get to know them better. Are you ready? Sure, man. Throw it at All me. right. Favorite late night snack or cheat meal? Oh, protein bar, actually. <laughs> Besides Mount Everest, is there any location you visited that you're proud of that you're allowed to talk about? Yeah, you know, I would say maybe the pyramids of Egypt uh, because of the fact that I actually got to scale on the pyramids, which you're not normally supposed to do. But one of the police officers, you know, pointed at it and said, go on up there. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's so cool. What would you say is the most unique place you visited? Well, you know, it's hard to it's hard to top Everest from that perspective. Uh, but some of the places like uh, South Africa, it's Dirkfontein, which is the cradle of life where they found, for example, the first Authiopistine species, you know, with the convergent species between man and ape. You know, that was pretty unique because now you're going back six million years into history. And that kind of just, you know, shakes you up a little bit about, wow, you know, this is this is something special. And what are we doing here? Kind of a thing. Who or what inspired you to become an actor and performer? You know, I think it was more about the fact of saying, how can I express myself? And probably how can I express myself in the most wacky way without being put in a straight jacket or, th or thrown into prison? Well said, well said. Do you have an all-time favorite actor and actress? I don't, uh, because I think it would be, uh, you know, unfair and not do them justice if I just named one. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Is there a movie or two that you could watch like 50, 100 times and it just never gets old? You know, I'll tell you what, the movie that I have watched 50, 100 times, it never gets old. And it's not necessarily because it might be the best movie, but it just was kind of something that resonated with me, uh, you know, at a younger years where uh, the Blues Brothers, mm -hmm. you know, it was just it was just wacky, crazy. And, and my friend and I, we would recite the lines from it. And so, yeah, I think that's probably the movie I've seen the most and dip my teeth in the most. <laughs> <laughs> being a host, being a filmmaker, being an actor, do all three kind of complement each other over time? Do you feel like being a, a filmmaker is making you a better actor and vice versa? 
Absolutely, because then you get all the spectrums from behind the lens and in front of the lens. And a lot of things, a lot of times actors don't have a good sense of what it actually takes to make movies. And a lot of filmmakers don't have a, have a good sense of what it takes to be an actor or a host. So being able to do all three of those things, I think, helps in the long run, because then you can relate to everybody on set, everybody, you know, in the crew, and also make it also easier to interact with those different elements of a production. What would you say was your first real break in acting or, or performing? One that kind of really led you to this path where you eventually became a filmmaker. You know, I did this dark comedy way back when by the name of American Dream. Uh, and uh, that, that probably was one of the things that kind of led me into cementing my road or my path, you know, that I want to do something with regards to production, either behind and or in front of the camera. So I think that was probably, you know, that first step that put me into that position. Most awkward moment as an actor and performer. Ooh, that would also have been on, on an American dream because we had a lot of hidden camera scene, a lot of like uh, jackass kind of stuff in that oh, film. Yeah. What we did is we blended real life footage and scenes with stage shots. And so then I'm forced and I, was, I played a mentally handicapped character in that movie. So I'm out in public, you know, and I'm doing this outlandish stuff because what we're trying to do is to validate what we're telling you in the story through real life reactions. So being out in these public places and acting uh, mentally handicapped and seeing people's responses from all across the board that you can imagine. Uh, that probably was the most awkward thing because again, it wasn't in a scripted environment. It was out there and it's real and it's raw and you have to deal with it and improvise along the way. So why at the same time staying in character? That's wild. I'll definitely have to check that out. Is that streaming somewhere? Probably? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can still get it on. I think you can get it on Amazon and, and uh, you probably can get it on some other platforms as well. But yeah, it's it's if you're into dark uh, comedy and twisted kind of humor, uh, go check it out. Cool. Uh, not counting all the crazy close calls you had in the Quest of Nepal. What's your most awkward moment as a filmmaker? Maybe something more on the lighter side, not necessarily the near death side. Yeah, you know, I, I think some of the more awkward moments is walking into situations that you didn't expect, right? You go and say, okay, we're going to film this, or I got to walk in and then I got to be in part of this scene, and you didn't expect it. And then all of a sudden, some random stuff happens. Someone drops their pants on accident, or, they, you know, they rip their, you know, their, their outfit because, you know, the, the costume department is switching an outfit and the whole thing comes dropping down. But then, you know, they didn't even realize that the amount of people that are around. So it always makes for good fun. It also makes for, you know, kind of that post-production you know laugh where you can always kind of jab at somebody so you know i kind of like those moments as well yeah de de definitely on the lighter side and you know not having to worry about avalanches and things like <laughs> yeah, that and crevasse, yeah crevasses crevasses and stuff like that yeah absolutely. yeah I'll, i would much rather have a wardrobe malfunction than than you know get hit with a giant like sheet of ice so <laughs> no question Noted. about it no question about it <laughs> what's the best piece of advice you give for success you know what? I think Everest kind of taught me, or should I say reiterated what my original beliefs were on success. And the one thing is that it's not about Everest. It's about your own personal Everest, trying to conquer whatever that is to you. Because there's always something in your life that you can make into your personal Everest. And if you're willing to set out and be hyper-focused at it, you may or may not be able to, but you at least give it a good opportunity and chance to conquer your own personal Everest. And to do that, in my opinion, you have to go 20% harder than anything you've ever done in your life. Because if you want to make it to the top of Everest, you have to go 20% harder than anything you've ever done in your life. But that's also a difference between living and dying. So that's the, those are, these are more of the extreme scenarios and how it relates because you're on Mount Everest, but you can then take that with you. And people can say, okay, if I just go harder, I know I can go 20% more hours in the day. I can go 20% less sleep. I can go work out 20% harder if I had to. And I can also be mentally focused at, at the job at hand 20% harder if I had to, to get this done, whatever that is that you're trying to achieve. That's awesome. Love that. And in one line or less, why should people check out the Quest Nepal? Well, because I think it's really an epic educational throw ride to the top of the world. And I think and hope that you will learn something along the way. The Quest in Nepal, May 24th, available on all major streaming platforms. Alex, thank you so much for your time. Where can we find you online? Well, you know, you can find me online at alexhars.com or you can Google me if you want, or you can go to thequestnepal.com and you can see me splattered all over there too. <laughs> Excellent. Easy enough. Alex, thank you so much, man. Greatly appreciate it, Fred. And you have a good day.